no, why? Ugh, one moment, please, because the webcam decided to just conk out for some unknown reason. Why? That's so rude. Sorry. <laughs> Go on, Yavin. Give us a call. Um, let's see. Enable the webcam. Come on. <laughs> well, this is turning into a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Uh, you know, last week at Lunch Bunch, we had uh, an interesting challenge of having no color because we're just learning how Twitch works. Um, which was very on point because we were reading uh, The Hound of the Baskervilles uh, by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, which is a Sherlock Holmes story. Um, and apparently, I thought, see, like, we had fixed the color video issue. Mm -hmm. um, I can confirm it was in color earlier. It was in color earlier. We managed yeah. to get color working, but apparently <laughs> we have gone even farther backwards to where... Uh, there is no capability <laughs> of visual anything. Disconnected advice. Come on now. <laughs> I, all right. Honestly, we'll we're probably going right. back to... It, going, it fits our mood. It do. Let's actually <laughs> see if it actually works this time. Heavy sigh. All right. We're going to go back to this. We'll do be right back. We're learning Twitch. <laughs> Hooray for that. Um, yeah. Yeah. This is a fun time. All right. We will be right back as we do some troubleshooting. <laughs> Thank you for being patient with us. This should be grand. <laughs> I hope somebody highlights this and is just like, look at these. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go viral. We'll go viral. Yeah. All right. See you in, hopefully see you in just a moment. Yay! We did it! Technical we difficulties. Did it. And, we got uh, it. and apparently, um, <laughs> still no color. Uh, but I would rather take this. I would rather than not seeing seeing anything. <laughs> I mean, we could be great podcasters, but we could. Be I good. definitely, I definitely, as a selfish human being, I like to see myself on camera. I, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Vain. Yeah, <laughs> just a little. Uh, All right, well, welcome officially to uh, Lunch Bunch. This is the Addison Public Library's Lunch Bunch. Um, my name is Courtney. I am one of the teen services librarians, uh, the specialist at the library here. And you are? And I'm Matt. I am the business services specialist here at the library. Uh, we also refer to ourselves as snark and sass, as you can probably figure out why. Yeah. We're not sure which is which. Uh, it probably changes on the regular. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so this is Lunch Bunch. Uh, this is a hour out of your midday. Uh, hopefully that you'll grab something to eat. Um, after this, I will be devouring my own lunch. I'm so hungry already. Um, but this is uh, our second uh, live stream on Twitch. Um, we are clearly still figuring it out, <laughs> uh, but thank you for some grace and, you know, just being here with us. And even if you're watching this later, uh, when it's on our YouTube, you welcome. We're so glad that you're here and that you're enjoying this. Uh, if you want to find out about more things that are going on at the Addison Public Library, uh, we have our fancy little newsletter, um, who may or may not be on the cover. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, it's a great yeah. picture. <laughs> so I don't know why you don't like. It's a great picture. My hair was so flat. Anyway, <laughs> look, 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 it has. It should have volume. <laughs> anyway, uh, so inside this newsletter in particular, we have a section about our Twitch streams. Um, for this case, every Tuesday in May. Uh, from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m., we are going to be doing Lunch Bunch, where we read uh, one of 
a story that is available to us, and we've been reading The Hound of the Baskervilles, uh, which is a Sherlock Holmes story by Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, well, we're on week two of that, so I'll give you a recap. Because you weren't here Because I was not time. here for a week You one. were not here last no. time. So you were not there for the wonderful adventure of me trying to pronounce some very long, <laughs> complicated words. Um, so in May, it's... We're doing this from 11 to 12, but in June, we're going a little bit earlier and we're doing it from 10 to 11 and we're calling that one Breakfast in Books. <laughs> so it'll be very similar, but we'll also do some little more booky things too. Yeah, cool. Mm-hmm. We also have some Let's Plays that are coming up. Uh, we have, we're filming those ahead of time because schedules are hard. <laughs> um, and we'll be, the first one premieres Wednesday, May 22nd, uh, and that's going to be at five o'clock. So hopefully we'll be able to see you there and, uh, you can hang out with us. I'll be in the chat. Um, I don't know if anybody else will be in the chat, <laughs> uh, but we'll be watching that. We played uh some board games and it was a lot of fun are you gonna be there for the next filming i potentially might be depending on my schedule Ooh, hope so. as we're talking about scheduling <laughs> yes, indeed. so it's, it's it was a lot of fun um and i'm really excited to premiere it for you so that you can see it yourself too uh now the big thing is that on may 28th which is a tuesday at 12 30 is our summer reading announcement stream so it is a stream that is dedicated just to telling you all about the great things that are going on at the library during the summer we're going to talk about the books that are available that you can get through our summer reading program uh what different things like summer volunteering and Mm -hmm. like a bunch of different programs and activities that are happening throughout the summer that we're all really excited about yeah so we'll it'll be fun you'll hear a lot about a lot of books (laughs) uh because we got a lot of books (laughs) we there are a lot of great choices out there Mm -hmm. and i do want to as the business librarian here i do want to throw out a shout out to our local businesses they donated some amazing coupons that are going to be going in our summer reading bags this year so that is just a little little sneak peek to one of the items that are going to be in the summer reading bags we love our local businesses. Yeah. They are so amazing. And they they're are. so generous. And mm-hmm. like we've got such a cool community, yeah. honestly. We do. We so do. Well, we're so fortunate. All right. Shall we get going? I think we shall. All right. So uh, we are, once again, reading The Hound of the Baskervilles. Uh, if you are an Addison resident or even really just in, you know, uh, Swan Libraries in Illinois, which is our consortium that we're part of, uh, you can also get a copy of The Hound of the Baskervilles. Um, honestly, this this is one of his more famous stories, so frankly, if you can't find a copy of this one, I'm very concerned for you. Um, but if you can't, hey, good, look, good news. We're, we're reading it to you. So. <laughs> um, but if you want to get a copy that looks like this in particular, we have like four copies uh, in the library, our, our own library. Um, and if you find a cover that actually looks significantly better than this, I'm jealous because uh, mm-hmm. this is a horrible cover. Um, so what happened last time? For those of you who were not there, uh, a.k.a. Matt. Uh, yeah, sorry. Me, I, I'm guilty of that. <laughs> <laughs> Sam was this last time. So. Um, so Sherlock and John Watson, his friend, uh, were hanging out in their flat. Um, they had found a cane of some sort that would had been left there by somebody. And uh, they were kind of like discussing who it could possibly belong to. Um, and while they're doing that, uh, Sherlock was like, oh, the owner of this cane had a dog. And he's like, well, how can you tell? Well, because there's chew marks in the middle of the cane. Uh-huh. And he goes, it could be like, it's probably between like the size of this kind of dog to like this kind of dog. And he goes, in fact, I think it's, in fact, yes, it was a cocker spaniel. And he's just like, how do you know that? And he's like, well, he's right there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As someone just listening to this right now, I was like, how, how does he know? And then you're just like, well, he's just right there. That is like the... <laughs> that is like I could just visualize that mm-hmm. and then me being that person that's yeah. like oh well, yeah he's right there <laughs> indeed so uh, that man uh, James Mortimer uh, who is a uh, country doctor of sorts um, and he does like psycho uh, psychoanalysis and things like that mm-hmm. it's, he's not dived into that very strongly but that's my that's my opinion on it <laughs> so he does he's a doctor um, who is close to this family that their last name is the Baskerville family. Mm -hmm. Um, And they have history of having land ownership. Now, there's also supposedly a curse that follows this family because years ago, there was like 
the, I don't know, an uncle or somebody, like some dude who was kind of in charge of, th- of stuff, who was nasty. Like he, he uh, mm. was interested in this woman uh, and he pretty much kidnapped her and with intending to uh, forcibly marry her, she climbed out the, well, so he kidnapped her, locked her in an upstairs room while he and his buddies got drunk. And she's like upstairs listening to all of this and she's terrified. So she makes a rope out of some sheets or no, she climbs down the ivy and okay. escapes into the moors, which is like a region where it's very hilly and uh, people disappear in those things. <laughs> it's it's oh, hilly, wow. it's misty, it's spooky. Um, in fact, my last name, uh, so my last name is Moor, uh, and it comes from, like, people from the Moors. Oh, so. wow. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Fun little so, tidbit. I'm from a spooky man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'm from here. Anyway. <laughs> um but he finds out that she escaped. So she was running to her home miles away, uh-huh. cutting through the moors. And he finds out that she escapes, gathers up his hunting hounds, and sicks them on her and, try, and like jumps on his horse and runs after her to hunt her down. Wow, and okay. all of his buddies are like, wait, this is messed up. <laughs> So they like jump on their horses and chase after him to try and stop him. him. Okay, yeah. before he can get find before her. he can find her and okay. her, harm her because they finally realize like, wait, this is this is messed up. Yeah. <laughs> like, why are we friends with this yeah. guy? <laughs> um, so they then hear like a bunch of howling and they they come across this farmer who looks absolutely petrified and mm-hmm. they're like. Where's our buddy? And they were like, well, I saw this woman running, and then there were a bunch of hounds following her, and then I saw that guy on his horse galloping at full speed, but he looked terrified because he was being chased by a massive black monstrous dog. Wow. So, which, you know, you're like, come up and see. Yeah, literally. <laughs> like, this guy. <laughs> um, so he then... Uh, so the friends go and they, they find the woman. Well, they find, like, they come across and they, they find the, the pack of the dogs uh-huh. um, who are terrified. Uh, and they come in. I think it was, like, a stone circle. So very spooky there. Uh, and inside is the body of the woman. So she did die, oh, no. which is very sad. But next to her is also the body of that guy, that nasty dude. Uh, and he is currently having his throat ripped out by the, a the massive... Hounds. No, not one of his hounds, oh. but like the monster hound. Oh, um, okay. So since then, uh, the Baskerville family has kind of been haunted by mysterious deaths and seeing hallucinations and such and things. So now to current times, well, current times, um, the latest family member of the Baskervilles, they like lost their fortune, but this one guy uh, managed to build it back up, Uh buy the old home back, uh, and he was out walking, and he was found dead just out on a walk. Um, very mysterious. And people were saying that, like, he had been seeing things and was getting pretty paranoid. And it's like... Okay. You know. And then he was found dead. And he, it, the, his face, like, looked like his heart gave out. And, like, he was scared of something. Uh-huh. So uh, so this doctor friend, uh, James Mortimer, has Ooh, gone to Sherlock Holmes to ask what's up. Uh-huh. And also, uh, there's a, like, cousin... I think a cousin uh, who is going to inherit this new place, and uh, we're going to oh, see. Ooh. We're going to see what's up. Interesting. So, uh, Doctor Mortimer had just finished reading <clears throat> a newspaper article, basically telling the facts of the case of how uh, the Sir Charles Baskerville was the man who was found dead uh, while mm-hmm. he was on his walk. Um, And they also talk about how his next of kin, Mr. Henry Baskerville, uh, if he is still alive, is the son of Sir Charles's younger brother. So it's his nephew. And he's the one who's going to be leaving it. And so the the young man was last heard to be in America. And uh, people are trying to get a a hold of him. So that's what the article says. So here we go. Back into it. 
We are, we are on page 12. <laughs> a lot happened in the first 12 pages. It really did. So, <laughs> you know, which is nice. Yeah. <laughs> All right. It kicks off. It goes off swinging. So here we go. Dr. Mortimer free folded his paper and replaced it in his pocket. Those are the public facts, Mr. Holmes, in connection with the death of Sir Charles Baskerville. I must thank you, said Sherlock Holmes, for calling my attention to a case which certainly presents some features of interest. I had observed some newspaper comment at the time, but I was exceedingly preoccupied by that little affair of the Vatican cameos. And in my anxiety to oblige the Pope, I lost touch with several interesting English cases. This article, you say, contains all the public facts? It does. Then let me have the private ones. He leaned back, put his fingertips together, and assumed his most impassive and judicial expression. In doing so, said Mr. Dr. Mortimer, who had begun... If I called him Mr. Mortimer, oh my goodness. <laughs> the insult. He, he is a doctor. <laughs> a doctor, sir. Yes. Um, so, in doing so, said Dr. Mortimer, who had begun to show signs of some strong emotion. Oh my. Um, <laughs> scandalous for an Englishman. <laughs> <laughs> I am telling that which I have not confided to anyone. My motive for withholding it from the coroner's inquiry is that a man of science shrinks from placing himself in the public position of seeming to endorse a popular superstition. I had the further motive that Baskerville Hall, as the paper says, would certainly remain untenanted so like uninhabited, if anything were done to increase its already rather grim reputation. For both these reasons, I thought that it was justified in telling rather less than I knew, since no practical good co could come of a result from it. But with you, there is no reason why I should not be perfectly frank. The moor is sparsely inhabited, and those who live near each other are thrown very much together. For this reason, I saw a good deal of Sir Charles Baskerville, with the exception of Mr. Franklin of Laughter Hall and Mr. Stippleton of The Naturalist. There are no other men of education within many miles. Sir Charles was a retiring man, but the chance of his illness brought us together, and a community of interest in science kept us so. We had brought back much scientific information from South Africa, and many a charming evening was spent together discussing the comparative anatomy of the... <laughs> okay, <laughs> this, is, this is where it's like this book was written in the 1800s, and uh, terms that are very inappropriate now. But we're keeping true to the book, but we do not say these things. <laughs> All right, so discussing the comparative anatomy of the Bushman and the Hottentot. Oh. Oof. Not not appropriate terminologies. Uh, those were uh, very outdated terms for specific types of people um, and communities of people. No, mm -hmm. not good. We don't use them. Today. No, no, we moved on from mm -hmm. that. The, every so often that pops up at this. <laughs> like, it was just like, oh, right, 1800s. We have learned and we have grown and we have improved. Mm -hmm. All right, next up. Within the last few months, it became increasingly plain to me that Sir Charles's nervous system was strained to the breaking point. He had taken this legend, which I have read to you exceedingly to heart, so much so that although he would walk in his own grounds, nothing would induce him to go out upon the moor at night. Which honestly is good advice anyway. It's mm -hmm. dangerous. Anyway. I mean, if, especially if it's so spooky and there's fog everywhere and yeah. it's hilly. And like... you, can, you can trip and break an ankle. Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not bad plan. Yeah. And like, they didn't have flashlights at no, this time. No, they had like, so, like, lanterns. Yeah, and, and barely if those lanterns were portable. <laughs> so like, yeah, not good to go out at not night. Not good, in no. These eras. Yeah. Oh, incredible as it may seem to you, Mr. Holmes, he was honestly convinced that the dreadful fate hung overhung his family. And certainly the records which he was able to give of his ancestors were not encouraging. The idea of some ghastly presence constantly haunted him. And on more than one occasion, he had asked me whether I had on my medical journeys at, at night ever seen any strange creature or heard the baying of a hound. The later, the latter question he put to me several times, and always with a voice which vibrated with excitement. 
I can well remember driving up to his house in the evening some three weeks before the fatal event. He chanced to be at his hall door. I had descended from my gig, which is the car, or yeah, that's or how he drove up there. Mm-hmm. Do they have cars? In, I don't think. Buggy, I, who cares? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so his gig, which was standing in front of him. When I saw his eyes fix themselves over my shoulder and stare past me with an expression of the most dreadful horror, I whisked around and just in time to catch a glimpse of something which I took to be a rather large black calf passing at the head of the drive. So excited and alarmed was he that I was compelled to go down to the spot where the animal had been and look around for it. It was gone, however, and the incident appeared to make the worst impression upon his mind. I stayed with him all evening, and it was on the, that occasion to explain the emotion which he had shown that he had confided in to my keeping the narrative which I read to you when first I came. I mention this small episode because it assumes some importance in view of the tragedy which has followed. But I was convinced at the time that the matter was entirely trivial and that his excitement had no justification. It was at my advice that Sir Charles was about to go to London. His heart was, I knew, affected. And the constant anxiety in which he lived, however chimerical, ooh, that's a fun oh, word, yeah, that is chimerical, fun. However chimerical the cause it may have might be, it was evidently having a serious effect upon his health. I thought that a few months uh, among the distractions of town would send him back to it as a new man. Mr. Stapleton, a mutual friend whom was much a mutual friend who was much concerned as his state of health, was of the very same opinion. At the last instant came the terrible catastrophe. So it was like right when he was going to go to visit in London, uh, he was just found dead. So, suspicious. Mm-hmm. Um, on the night of Sir Charles's death, Barrymore, the butler, who made... Oh, we brought a butler. Oh, there's you a know, butler! You know it's always a good crime story when there's a butler there's involved. A butler. <laughs> we need to meet the butler. When are, when are we going to meet the butler? Okay. So, on the night of Sir Charles's death, Barrymore the butler, who made the discovery, oh, poor guy, uh, sent Perkins, the groom, on horseback to me. And as I was sitting up late, I was able to reach the Baskerville Hall within an hour of the event. I checked and corroborated all of the facts which were mentioned at the inquest. I followed the footsteps down the U Alley, and I saw the spot at the Moorgate where he seemed to have waited. I remarked the change in the shape of the prints after that point. Oh, that's an important part. Um, so the footprints that he had when he was walking to the gate were like solid footy prints. Mm-hmm. But then uh, leaving the gate, it looked like he was on his tippy toes. Oh. Which I know means boy be running. Uh-huh. <laughs> he be running. He be running. Yeah, yeah. which I'm sure will come up. Uh, but that's probably because I think I know that he's running from Sherlock Holmes stories. <laughs> so... <laughs> Anywho, all right, so uh, I remarked upon the change uh, in the shape of the prince after that point, and finally I carefully examined the body, which had not been touched until my arrival. Sir Charles lay on his face, his arms out, his fingers dug into the ground, and his features convulsed with such some strong emotion to such an extent that I could hardly have sworn to his identity. There was certainly, so he was like, so freaked mm-hmm. out that he couldn't, like, so nervous that he couldn't, uh, like, make out, like, is this my friend or not? Exactly. <laughs> so there was certainly no physical injury of any kind, but one false statement was made by Barrymore at the inquest. He said that there was no traces upon the ground around the body. He did not observe any, but I did. Some little distance off, but fresh and clear. Footprints? Footprints. A man or a woman's? Dr. Mortimer looked strangely at us for an instant, and his voice almost sank to a whisper as he answered. Mr. Holmes, they were the footprints of a gigantic hound. Wow. <laughs> Spookany! <Yeah. laughs> okay, this hound. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of thinking, okay. If it's gigantic footprints, is it like the size of 
a werewolf potentially? Ooh, werewolf. Or is it like so it could be is it some half or is it a human that in a full moon will go beast? Oh man. And or yeah. is it just like, or like what a, we would consider like a German shepherd size dog? It could, it could <laughs> well, like, I mean, if you've seen like a Great Dane or uh-huh. like an Irish wolfhound, which which would be a breed that mm-hmm. they would have kind of they would have had, known. I do believe yeah. so. Like those puppies be big. Yeah. They big puppers. <laughs> yeah. So or like a mastiff. He did say mm-hmm. mastiff before, and those okay. dogs are those are huge. huge. Um, yeah. so like it could be one of those or just one that's just like quite, quite mm-hmm. big. Yeah. Um, so who knows? I mean, maybe, More maybe it's a demon dog. Out. Maybe yeah. it's a hellhound, mm-hmm. a, a cousin of Cerberus, who knows? Or, you know, I we could Scooby do it and it's some dude in a suit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if they're talking about it as chimerical. Chimerical. That's such a good word. Maybe yeah. it could be some like... They're going to the the myth the mythical land. If they're thinking, yeah, you know, chimerical, chimerical. Mm-hmm. That that was a fun one to say. I'm That's like that a one. good word for the day. It's a good, yeah, chimerical. There yeah. we go. All right, chapter three: the problem. I confess at these words a shudder. This is John Watson talking now. Okay, uh, that's this is quite tricky because it's like it's solid dialogue. Mm-hmm. So. Bear with me. I'm trying. <laughs> Courtney will try to do the voices. Though. I will try. I will, you know. Ooh. Okay. So John Watson is saying this as the narrator kind of. I confess that these words, a shudder, passed through me. There was a thrill in the doctor's voice which showed that he was deep himself deeply moved by which he had told us. Holmes leaned forward in his excitement, and his eyes had that hard, dry glitter which shot from them when he was keenly interested. You saw this, as clearly as I see you, and you said nothing. What was the use? Well, how was it that no one else saw it? The marks were some twenty yards from the body, and no one gave them a thought. I don't suppose I should have done so had I not known the legend." There are more sheepdogs on the moor, no doubt, but this is no sheepdog. You say it was large, enormous, but it had not approached the body. No. What sort of night was it? Damp and raw. I don't know what that means. (laughs) But not actually raining. No. Was, what is the alley like? There are two lines of the old yew hedge, 12 feet high and impenetrable. The walk in the center is about eight feet across. Dude, knowing these details, well done. Is there anything between the hedges and the walk? Yes, there is a strip of grass about six feet broad on each side. I understand that the yew hedge is is penetrated at one point by a gate. Yes, the wicket gate, which leads on to the moor. Is there any other opening? None. So that is to so that to reach the U alley, so that either has to come down from the house, um, or else you have to enter it by the moor gate. There is an exit through a summer house at the far end of the alley. Had Sir Charles reached this? No, he lay about fifty yards from it. Now tell me, Doctor Mortimer, and this is important. This marks which you saw were on the path and not on the grass. No marks could be shown on the grass. Were they on the same side of the path as the moor gate? Yes, they were on the edge of the path on the same side as the moor gate. You interest me exceedingly. Another point, was the wicket gate closed? Closed and padlocked. How high was it? About four feet high. Then anyone could have gone over it. Yes. And what marks did you see by the wicket gate? None in particular. Good heaven, did no one examine? Yes, I examined myself and found nothing. It was all very confused. Sir Charles had, right? Yeah, it was all very confused. Sir Charles had evidently stood there for five or ten minutes. How do you know that? Because the ash had dropped twice from his cigar. Excellent! This is a colleague, Watson, after our very own heart. But the marks. He had left his own marks all over the small patch of gravel. I could discern no others. 
Sherlock Holmes struck struck his hand against his knee with an impatient gesture. So basically, like, <laughs> wow, yeah. So he's like into this. Yeah, he is. <laughs> he's very he's hardcore it. into this investigation. Very much so. Yeah. And also, props to the guy for being like, hmm, cigar ash. Yeah, like that's that's actually very clever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, so Sherlock Holmes struck his hand against his knee with an impatient gesture. If only I had been there, he cried. It was evidently a case of extraordinary interest and one which presented immense opportunities to the scientific expert. That gravel page upon which I might have read so much has been long ere this smudge uh, smudged by the rain and defaced by the clogs of curious peasants. Oh, Dr. Mortimer, Dr. Mortimer, to think that you should not have called me in, you have indeed much to answer for. I could not call you in, Mr. Holmes, without disclosing these facts to the world, and I have already given my reasons for not wishing to do so. Besides, besides, why do you hesitate? There is a realm in which the most acute and most experienced of detectives is helpless. You mean that the thing is supernatural. I did not positively say so. Are we talking werewolf now? (laughs) Curses! I did not positively say so. No, but you evidently think it. Since the tragedy, Mr. Holmes, there have come to my ears several incidents which are hard to reconcile with the settled nature, order of nature. For example, I find that before the terrible event occurred, several people had seen a creature upon the moor which corresponds with this Baskerville demon and which could not possibly be any animal known to science. They all agreed that it was a huge creature, luminous, ghastly, and spectral. It ha- I have cross-examined these men, one of them a hard-headed countryman, one a farrier, and one a moorland farmer, who all tell the same story of this dreadful apparition, exactly corresponding to the hellhound of legend. I assure you that there is a reign of terror in this district and that it is a hardy man who will cross the moor at night. And you, a trained man of science, believe this to be supernatural? I do not know what to believe. Holmes shrugged his shoulders. I have hitherto confined my investigations to this world he said. In a modest way, I have combated evil, but to take on the father of evil himself would, perhaps, be too ambitious a task. Yet you must admit that the footmark is material. The original hound was material enough to tug a man's throat out, and yet he was diabolical as well. I see that you have quite gone over to the supernaturalist's But now, Dr. Mortimer, tell me this. If you hold these views, why have you come to consult me at all? You tell me in the same breath that it is useless to investigate Sir Charles's death and that you desire me and and that you desire me to do it. I do not say that I desired you to do it. Then how can I assist you? By advising me on what I should do with Sir Henry Baskerville, who arrives at Waterloo Station, Dr. Mortimer looked at his watch, in exactly one hour and a quarter. Ooh. (laughs) So one hour and 15 minutes. One hour and 15 minutes. (laughs) In an hour and 15 minutes, the heir, who was in America, uh, is coming in. Is going to be landing. And like, Mm -hmm. curses. (laughs) So Sherlock Holmes says, he he being the heir. Yes, on the death of Sir Charles, we inquired for this young gentleman and found that he had been farming in Canada. From the accounts which have reached us, he is an excellent fellow in every way. I speak now not as a medical man, but as a trustee and executor of Sir Charles's will. There is no other claimant, I presume? None. The only other kinsman whom we have seen who have been able to trace was Roger Baskerville, the youngest of three brothers of whom Sir poor Sir Charles was the elder. 
Roger was the black sheep of the family. He came of the old masterful bas- uh, blah, 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 blah. He came of the old master masterful Baskerville. Ooh, that was very That's a tongue oddly. <laughs> masterful Baskerville. <laughs> Woof. Okay. Yeah, say yeah. that five times fast. <laughs> Woof. No pun intended. No. <laughs> uh, so he came of the old Masterville Baskerville. No, I still didn't say it right. Moving on. Straight. Uh, and was the very image, they tell me, of the family portrait portrait of the old Hugo. Hugo being the original Baskerville the original, who chased yeah. after the girl and started the curse. Oh. So he is apparently the spitting image of the evil dude at the beginning of this story. Oh, wow. Ooh, okay. the plot thickens. The plot thickens. <laughs> he uh, made England too hot to hold him. So he got in trouble a lot. Yeah, there. so he got, yeah, so that's why he probably went to Canada. Yeah. Uh, so actually, he specifically fled to Central America, oh, and okay. he died there in 1876 of yellow fever. Oh, we're talking about the the, of, uh, yeah, uh, the, the ancestor. Yeah. That's, okay. No, no, no. So the ancestor is Hugo, who uh-huh. got his throat ripped out by yes. the original puppy. Um, Roger is the only other like relative that they were able to track down. Uh-huh. But he got in trouble a lot, went to South America okay. or Central America rather, and mm-hmm. died there in 1876 of yellow fever, which is okay. not a great way to go. No. All right. So Henry is the last of the Baskervilles. So Henry is who we're talking about. Gotcha. Okay. So Henry is the last of the Baskervilles in one hour and five minutes now. So 10 minutes have passed. They talk so long. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so in one hour and five minutes, I meet him at Waterloo Station. I have had a wire that he arrived at Southampton this morning. Now, Mr. Holmes, what would you advise me to do with him? Why should he not go to the home of his father's? It seems natural, does it not? And yet consider that every Baskerville who goes there meets with an evil fate. I feel sure that if Sir Charles could have spoken with me upon his death, he would have warned me against bringing this, the last of his of the old race and the heir to great wealth, to that deadly p- place. And yet it cannot be denied that the prosperity of the whole poor, bleak countryside depends upon his presence. Um, that's because Sir Charles put a lot of money and effort to building up the community there and was very like so the community is very dependent on the baskerville family um because like he basically fostered the community to be able to thrive and uh like a lot of different things so dude was like upstanding yeah upstanding very very connected family it seems like yeah all right so all of the good work that has been done by sir charles will crash to the ground if there is no tenant at the hall I fear lest I should be swayed too much by my own obvious and interest in the matter, and that is why I bring the case before you and ask for your advice. So basically, like, so chances are this new guy, this kid is going to be cursed if he comes to live here, but I need him to be there, otherwise the community will fall apart. Hmm. So, like, the good of the one or the good of the many is yeah. the question here. Yeah, it's like a catch-22 right it there. It is. That's a tough one. Mm-hmm. So, Holmes considered for a little time. Put in to plain words, the matter is this, he said. In your opinion, there is a diabolical agency which makes Dartmoor an unsafe abode for a Baskerville. That is your opinion? At least I might go to the length to, of saying that there is some evidence that this may be so. <laughs> Exactly. But surely, if your supernatural theory to be correct, it could work that the young man, evil in London, uh, as e- Ah, sorry. So let's start that sentence again. But surely, if your supernatural theory be correct, it could work the evil, or it could work the young man, evil, in London as easily as in Devonshire. A devil with merely local powers, like a parish vestry, would be too inconceivable a thing. So, like, he's saying that, uh, you know, the hound could get him in London as well Mm -hmm. as in Dartmoor. Like, what's stopping that? Um, So, Dr. Mortimer says, uh, You put the matter more flippantly, Mr. Holmes, than you would probably do if you were brought into personal contact with these things. Your advice, then, as I understand it, is that the young man would be safe in Devonshire as in London. He comes in 50 minutes. What would you recommend? 
I recommend, sir, that you take a cab, call off your spaniel who is scratching at my front door, and proceed to Waterloo to meet Sir Henry Baskerville. And then, and then, you will say nothing to him at all until I have made up my mind about the matter. How long will it take you to make up your mind? Uh, Twenty-four hours. At ten o'clock tomorrow, Dr. Mortimer, I will be much obliged to you if you will call upon me here, and I will be of help to and it would be of help to me in my plans for the future if you will bring Sir Henry Baskerville with you. I will do so, Mr. Holmes. He scribbled the appointment on his shirt cuff and hurried off in his strange, peering, absent minded fashion. Holmes stopped him at the head of the stair. Only one more question, Dr. Mortimer. You say that before Sir, Ch- you say that before Sir Charles's, Charles Baskerville's death, several people saw this apparition upon the moor. Three people did. Did any see it after? I have not heard of any. Thank you. Good morning. Which is, then they would say that when it was like goodbye anyway. So, mm-hmm. Thus, so we don't get confused. <laughs> Normally we say that as a greeting. They would say it anyway. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. Holmes returned to his seat with a quiet look of inward satisfaction, which meant that he had a congenial task before him. Going out, Watson, unless I can help you. No, my dear fellow, it is at the hour of action that I turn to you for aid. But this is splendid, really unique from some points of view. When you pass Bradley's, would you ask him to send up a pound of the strongest tobacco? Thank you. It would be as well if you could make it convenient not to return before evening. Then I should be very glad to compare impressions as to this most interesting problem which has been submitted to us this morning. I knew that seclusion and solitude were very necessary for my friend in those hours of intense mental concentration, during which he weighed every particle of of evidence, constructed alternative theories, balanced one against the other, and made up his mind as to which points were essential and which were immaterial. I therefore spent the day at my club and did not return to Baker Baker Street until evening. It was nearly nine o'clock when I found myself in the sitting room once more. My first impression as I opened the door was the fire was that a fire had broken out, for the room was so filled with smoke that the lamp that the light of the lamp upon the table was blurred by it. Goodness sake. As I entered, however, my fears were set at rest, for it was the acrid fumes of strong, coarse tobacco which took me by the throat and set me coughing. Through the haze, I made a vague vision of Holmes in a dressing gown, coiled up into a chair, an armchair, with his black clay pipe between his lips. Several rolls of paper lay all around him. Caught cold, Watson, he said. No, it's this poisonous atmosphere. I suppose it is pretty thick, now that you mention it. Thick! It is intolerable! Open the window, then. You have been at your club all day, I perceive. My dear Holmes, am I right? Certainly, but how? This is where he brags. (laughs) (laughs) Also, the drama between... Oh, I know! I was like, yes. Of course. Of course. The smoke is taking me back. <laughs> like, oh, I'm coughing right away. <laughs> Although it's it's probably more smoke than air in It there. probably is, yes. Thank goodness And sake. it's definitely like an older English type way of writing. Oh, absolutely. But I love it. <laughs> I know. It's, it is, it's, it's such drama. Such sass. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So he laughed at my bewildered expression. There is a delightful freshness about you, Watson, which makes it a pleasure to ex... ex- I'm done. Uh, (laughs) Which makes it a pleasure to exercise any small powers which I possess at your expense. A gentleman goes forth on a showery and miry day. He returns immaculate in the evening with the gloss still on his hat and his boots. He has been a fixture, therefore, all day. In other words, he's not moved all day. (laughs) He is not a man with intimate friends. Where then could he have been? Is it not obvious? Well, it is rather obvious. The world is full of obvious things which nobody at any chance ever observes. Where do you think that I have been? A fixture also, 
basically like also just sitting there smoking constantly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Sean Holmes says, on the contrary, I have been to Devonshire. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Turn of events right there. <laughs> and, and Watson goes, in spirit. <laughs> and Holmes goes, exactly. <laughs> My body has remained in this armchair and has, I regret to observe, consumed in my absence two large pots of coffee and an incredible amount of tobacco. Wow. So just yeah. he's he's living on coffee and tobacco right now. Yeah. I would be so jittery just based on the coffee. <laughs> two he said two pots of coffee? Two two large pots of two coffee. Two large pots. Okay. And okay. also Whew. tobacco, which honestly is probably closer to like marijuana. Not yeah. Mm-hmm. Like it's it probably is much stronger than what we would find in like cigarettes now. Mm-hmm. And also does not have filters or anything thereupon. Mm-hmm. Um, after you left, I sent down to Stanford's for the ordinance map of this portion of the moor, and my spirit has hovered over it all day. I flatter myself that I could find my way about. A large-scale map, I presume? Very large. He unrolled one section, held it over his knee. Here you have the particular district which concerns us. That is Baskerville Hall in the middle. With a wood around it? Exactly. I fancy the U alley, which, though not marked under the name, must stretch along this line with the moor, as you perceive, upon the right of it. This small clump of buildings here is the hamlet of Grimpen. 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 The hamlet of Grimpen, which is like a little clustering of towns. Uh, Or like a little town with a bunch of little... uh, Yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. Grimpen. Uh, And that is where our friend, Dr. Mortimer, has his headquarters. Within a radius of five miles, there are, as you see, only very few scattered dwellings. Here is Laughter Hall, which was mentioned in the narrative. There is the house indicated here, which may be the residence of the naturalist Stapleton. And if I remember right, that was his name. If I remember right, sure. Okay, but here are two moorland house Farmhouses, High Tor and Falmeyer. Awesome name for a house. <laughs> Falmeyer. <laughs> name my house that. Uh, then, 14 miles away, the great convict prison of Princeton. Ooh, there's a prison nearby. Mm, yes. Although, 14 miles away in this day and age was not nearby, but still. Between and around these scattered points extends the desolate, lifeless moor. This, then, is the stage upon which the tragedy has been played and upon which we may help to play it again. One more time. (laughs) Let's read that sentence one more time. (laughs) It is on this stage which tragedy has been played and upon which we may help to play it again. again. So they're thinking (laughs) that another tragedy is going to happen. And he's like, let's help. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Let's 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 see. Either like okay, it must be a wild place. That's interesting. Yes, for the setting is a worthy one. If the devil did desire to have a hand in the affairs of men, then you are yourself inclining to the supernatural explanation. The devil's agents may be of flesh and blood, may they not? There are two questions waiting for us at the outset. The one is whether any crime has been committed at all. The second is that the crime and how was, or what is the crime and how was it committed? So is there a crime and then what is the crime? Mm. So of outside of the ordinary laws of nature, there is an end of, there is an end of our investigation, but we are bound to exhaust all other hypotheses before falling back upon this one. I think we'll shut that window again, if you don't mind. It is a singular thing, but I find that a concentrated atmosphere helps a concentration of thought. I had not pushed it to the length of getting into a box to think, but that is a logical outcome for my convictions. Have you turned the case over in your mind? So he's like, "Mm, there's too much air here. (laughs) Please close the window. I need more smoke. Yeah, I was like, first there wasn't enough air. Yeah. Now there's too much air. Maybe in the future <laughs> I'll sit in a box. Yeah. <laughs> you would, too. All right. Uh, have you thought about the case? Yes, I have thought a good deal about it over the course of the day. And what do you make of it? It is very bewildering. 
It has certainly a character of its own. There are points of distinction about it. That change in that change in the footprints, for example. What do you make of it? Mortimer said that the man had walked on tiptoe down the portion of the alley. He only repeated what some fool had said at the inquest. Why should a man walk on tiptoe down the alley? What then? He was running, Watson. Running desperately. Running for his life. Running until he burst his heart and fell dead upon his face. See how he's running. Wow. Uh. <laughs> that was... <laughs> you were right there. He was running. He was running. But enough to burst his heart. I mean... Could you imagine? That, that's, that's... That's a lot of running. That's a bad stress test. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, running from what? There lies our problem. There are indications that the man who was crazed with fear before he had begun to run. How can you say that? I am presuming that the cause of his fears came to him across the moor. If that were so, and it seems most probable, only a man who had lost his wits would have run from the house instead of towards it. If the... See, this is where we get another word that we just don't use anymore. If the gypsy's evidence... Mm -hmm. No, not good. Anyway, so if that person's evidence may have been taken as true, he ran with cries for help in the direction where help was least likely to be. Then again, whom was he waiting for that night? And why was he waiting for them in the U alley rather than in his own house? You think that he was waiting for someone. The man was elderly and infirm. We can understand his taking an evening stroll, but the ground was damp and the night was inclement, which means that it could have started raining. It is natural that he should stand. Is it natural that he should stand for five to ten or ten minutes as Dr. Mortimer, with more practical sense than I should have given him credit for, deduced from his cigar ash? Cigar ash? But he was out every evening. I think it unlikely that he waited at the Moorgate every evening. On the contrary, the evidence is that he avoided the moor. That night he waited there. It was the night before he made his departure for London. The thing takes shape, Watson. It becomes coherent. Might I ask you to hand me my violin and we will postpone all further thought upon this business until we have had the advantage of meeting Dr. Mortimer and Sir Henry Baskerville in the morning. All right, we are on to chapter four and also on to, like, it's, yeah, we're time to end. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll end it there. Time. Um, but next time, uh, so it seems, we will be meeting uh, Sir Henry Baskerville and uh, the the further stories thereupon. Um, so very fun so I far. mean, more of the plot has thickened Much in thickening. these last couple of chapters, the last few pages. Truth. like. Very exciting to see what comes. Indeed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Should be fun. Fun times. Yeah. All right. Well, we will end it there. Um, thank you for joining us with our lunch bunch. It is now, if you have not eaten your lunch already, please go do so. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> we're going to probably go yeah. do so very shortly. Mm-hmm. Uh, once again, you can find uh, information about our upcoming programs on the Addison Public Library's website. Mm -hmm. Um, We will be back next week with uh, our next episode of Lunch Bunch, where we'll go on to Chapter 4. Yeah, and see how far we can get with that. Mm -hmm. And I believe... Yeah, next week on Wednesday is also when we're premiering our Let's Play video. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that'll be at 5 o'clock. You can hang out with me in the chat and watch us do silly things. And um, yeah, argue Mm -hmm. about when Einstein's theory of relativity happened. Uh, Oh, I'm interested about to watch that one. (laughs) I know, that sounds so (laughs) thrilling. (laughs) Like, ooh. Relativity. (laughs) All right, well, hope you all have a wonderful day. We'll see you around and have a good time. All right. Yeah. See you. Bye. Bye. End stream. Indeed.